continuing with our study of the Gospels, we're already up to part 23. Um, we're, we're almost to the uh, eight-month mark that we've been journeying through the Gospels together. And, uh, you know, e- each week our goal is to just learn more and more about our Messiah, uh, to see him kind of in, in his full image and just uh, understand him more and more each day. So I, I put on here uh, John 9:39. It says, For judgment I have come into this world that those not seeing might see, and those seeing might become blind. So it's a very interesting verse that we're uh, going to be covering. Um, it ties into a lot of what we've been talking about uh, going through the weeks, and uh, that's why I titled it Eyes to See, because um, we're hoping and praying each night that we you know, have the eyes to start seeing what Scripture is telling us uh, and ears to hear what the Father is trying to speak to us as we, as we journey through the Gospels. Uh, so just kind of to recap a little bit of everything that we've been talking about these, these past 23 uh, parts that we've done together, that we're, we're studying a, a synchronized version, a layered version of the Gospels, reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all at one time. So what we've used is we've used the, uh, the appointed days, the Moedim of Yahweh, to really link everything up, to put everything together and uh, know where we're at. And so what we've been unraveling through this is that uh, not only is uh, the, the spring Moedim, the, the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, and Pentecost all about his first coming, but all of the miracles that he's doing on these Moedim, all of the uh, you know, wonderful things that are taking place during these times, and they're all bringing us back to the word, to his word, and showing us that there is no difference between uh, Old and New Testament, that they are one word of God, uh, that the, the Old Testament is, is our uh, Messiah concealed, and, and the New Testament is the Torah revealed. And so that's kind of the goal as, as we're going through this in, entire thing. Yeah, I think the amazing thing about it is our Father, our Heavenly Father knew that we weren't the brightest people in the world. So by doing these every year for all of our lives, we were supposed to learn his message. We were supposed to learn his plan. We were supposed to learn his gospel. And if you had grown up with these and known every year what this meant, the gospel would be very clear and very apparent to you. We live in a society that's so far removed from these things and has been kept from these things that we don't fully understand God's plan. But once we fully understand the feast days, it it unlocks the key to everything that's in the Bible. And I think of it like, uh, you know, I, I was in... I was in the band and chorus and stuff growing up, and, and you rehearse over and over and over again before the you know actual performance, before the actual day of the year you're performing. And so what these uh, Moedim, these appointed times were, is you know leading up to the first coming of the Messiah, they were rehearsals. They were practicing them over and over and over again. So when they would uh, before the Passover, when they were all preparing, they were the reason they were all gathered in Jerusalem shouting Hosanna, Hosanna for the Passover Lamb is because that's what they did year after year after year. And so the time that our Messiah comes, they were there. They had rehearsed. They had practiced. And they were, they were ready to go. And so the, the fall Moedim that we're coming up, up on uh, quickly here within the next couple weeks is they, those are our rehearsals now, rehearsals for his second coming. So we look back on the spring Moedim with, um, you know, memorializing the day, but we are looking forward to and, and rehearsing uh, his second coming with, with the fall feasts. So kind of just recapping uh, the, the ministry of Yeshua each week, we talk about how uh, he's been staying out of the Jerusalem area, but we see him, he came to uh, Jerusalem for the Feast of Sukkot, one of the uh, pilgrimage feasts, and he uh, leaves again, and now he's back for um, Hanukkah, or the, uh, the Festival of Lights, the dedication uh, festival where <clears throat> he's going to be back in Jerusalem at this time, which is uh, at, our, at our point in, in the Gospels where we are right now. So seeing on our, on our wheel, we are in the, uh, in the December uh, time frame uh, after Sukkot, which was in uh, t- the September, October area. And Hanukkah, it's important to remember, Hanukkah and Purim, Purim celebrates the events of the Book of Ruth, are not feasts of Yahweh. They're not the seven Moedim of Yahweh. However, they are very solemn times, uh, times for celebration times to remember great things that have happened in history and this was the case where they overthrew the Greeks and took back the temple. The Greeks had slaughtered a pig on the altar, they had put up a statue of Zeus, they had forced uh, the people in Jerusalem to worship Zeus as God and the people rebelled led by uh, the Maccabee family and so this is what they celebrate in, with Hanukkah, the festival of lights, is when they repurified the temple to bring, bring back the worship of the true God. So recapping last week, we, uh, the last time we met, we talked about what is the light. And so our, our whole goal of the uh, evening was showing that Yeshua being the light, being our perfect example, he is the Torah. He is the word made flesh. 
So we, we went through all the scriptures talking about how he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and he is the light. And every time he's referencing those things, he's pointing us back to scripture uh, in the Torah, in the prophets, and, and showing us, giving us little snippets of what we need to go back and read, what we need to go back and study, showing us that he is that word made flesh and that he is walking it out to be our example. So we talked about in, in uh, Malachi 2, it says that the Torah is the way. In Psalm 119, it says that the Torah is the truth. In Proverbs 6, it says the Torah is the life. And in Isaiah 8, it says the Torah is the light. So when Jesus, our Messiah, when he's saying all of these things, he's illustrating us back to I am the Torah. I am everything that you have been reading. I am everything that you have been studying. I am now here in the flesh to walk it out and to show you how to do it because you've been doing it wrong for all of these years. So the verse that we talked about over and over again uh, was here in uh, John 8, 12, where it says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in dark darkness, but possess the light of life. So when we're following after him, when we're following after his example, the whole idea is that we will be walking in Torah, we will be walking in truth, leading us back to the instructions of the Father. And so I, I put up this illustration of, of outer darkness in, in the narrow way that we hear over and over again in Scripture. And following his path, following his truth, is leading us to the light at the end of, uh, at the end of this tunnel here. So getting into uh, the meat of tonight is we're going to continue in John 8 and 9 and hopefully get to John 10 and, and start to uh, wrap up some of uh, what, what's been going on, which is all one continuous uh, story here. So it says in John 8, uh, verse 17, In your Torah also it, it has been written that the witness of two men is true. I am one who witnesses concerning myself, and the Father who sent me witnesses concerning me. Therefore they said to him, Where is your father? Yeshua answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would have known my father also. These words Yeshua spoke in the treasury, teaching in the set-apart place, and no one laid hands on him, because his hour had not yet come. So what he's talking about here, he's, he's going through and he's saying, If you were knowing the instructions of the father, and following what scripture actually says, you would know who I am, because I am revealed from Genesis to Malachi or Second Chronicles, depending on what, what Bible you're looking at. But he's saying, I am in every page. So if you knew the Father, if you knew the words, you would know me. But you guys are following these doctrines of man. You're following traditions of, of men, and you're not following the word of God. And it's funny how 2,000 years removed from him saying that we seem to be on that same path today. We seem to be following more man-made rules and man-made traditions and man-made things that have been passed down and in theology and seminaries and not getting back to the word of God. Uh, Mike Bauer, who, who's not with us tonight, shared a clip on uh, Facebook and, and shared it with me of, of a, a well-known Protestant pastor. I won't mention his name since we're recording. Um, but he, he said that if he was the Protestant Pope and uh, if there was a, a Pope of the Protestant faith, what would be some of the rules that he would have? His very first rule that he mentioned was we need to get away from Scripture and focus more on Jesus because Scripture can't reach people, but the love of Jesus can. And I, and I thought, wow, how could this most prominent person in, in the faith be saying we need to remove ourselves from Scripture because Yeshua, our Messiah, is Scripture. He is the Word made flesh. So it's, it's a contradiction in itself. They're getting us away from the Word to teach about love of the Messiah. Well, 1 John 5.2 says that if you love me, you keep my commandments. This is the love of the Father by keeping my commands. And this is the love of your neighbor by keeping my commands. So how is it, how, how can we do both? And uh, that really stuck with me all weekend and it kind of made my stomach turn a little bit. Continuing in John 8 and in verse 21, I'll have Darren read it here for us, but. Therefore Yeshua said to them, I am going away and you shall seek me. You shall die in your sin. Where I go, you are unable to come. Then the Yehudim, the, the Yehudim, or the Jews, and every time John says the Jews, he's poking at the Pharisees, calling them the Jews, the, the religious leaders. So the Yehudim said, shall he kill himself because he says, where I go, you are unable to come? And he answered, and he said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you shall die in your sins. For if you did not believe, you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Pretty cut and dried right there. <laughs> and what is sin? You know, 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is transgression of the law. So he's showing us right here that if you're not going to believe me and you're not going to follow me, 
you're not going to know what sin is because you're going to keep doing your own things. You're going to keep doing what you want to do. It goes all the way back to the garden where the serpent says, you will know, you, you will know what right from wrong. You will be as gods. That, that's been the promise from the beginning is that we're going to determine what is right and wrong in our own eyes. And, and it's playing out again today. You know, if we're not held to the standards of, of Torah or of instruction of God, then we're going to determine what's right and wrong in our own eyes because we're not knowing what love of the Father is and how to love our neighbor as ourselves because he outlines that for us. So if we make up what's right and wrong, we are falling into the same trap that was happening 2,000 years ago and happening 4,000, 5,000 years before that in the garden when he said, you will be as gods, knowing right from wrong. Yeah, there's a line I love in the book of Judges. Every time something goes horribly bad for the people in the book of Judges, there's a line that pops up about seven, eight times and says, and there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And I think that's the whole problem. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And you, you have made yourself as God, knowing good from evil or deciding what is good and what is evil. So he continues in verse 25, he says, Then they said to him, Who are you? And Yeshua said to them, All together, that which I even say to you. I have much to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And what I heard from him, these words I speak to the world. They did not know what he spoke to them of the Father. So Yeshua said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, the Son of Adam, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do none at all of myself, but as my Father taught me. These words I speak. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And he was speaking these words, many believed in him. So Yeshua said to the Yehudim, the Pharisees who believed in him, If you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So again, what is truth? Psalm 119, 142 tells us that his righteousness is everlasting righteousness in his Torah his instruction is truth so again we see him directly telling us right here that if you stay and if you stay with me and in my word that you will know truth well what is truth truth is the Torah and they knew that at that time it was a, a, an easy substitute word he's saying if you know if you follow me I'm going to bring you back into the word I'm going to bring you back into the truth and I'm going to show you these instructions there's certain verses everybody knows in the Bible. One is, the truth shall set you free. Everybody knows that, whether you have the least bit of Bible knowledge, but you don't realize what it says before that. It says you have to be a taught one to know the truth. So the truth might set you free, but you got to be taught one to know the truth. And it takes, it takes effort to be a taught one. And so I wanted to go back real quick uh, just to a verse that we always reference over and over again. It says that I do none at all of myself, but as my Father taught me these words I speak, and he who sent me is with me. So over and over again, we hear, well, Jesus gave us new commands. He, he rewrote the law, or he did away with some of the law. He created easier laws or better laws, or he made things better. Right here, he's saying that, that that's complete garbage, if we're, if we're thinking that, because he did only what the Father said. And in Amos, it tells us that the Father does nothing without revealing it to his prophets first. So if we can't find anywhere in the Torah and the prophets that say... The, the law of God is going to be changed, the law of God is going to be altered, then it can't be true because that's how our Father works. He reveals it. He reveals the truth beforehand, before it acts. And right here, plainly, our Messiah says, I'm doing nothing that the Father didn't say or that the Father didn't do. So continuing in, in John 8, verse 33. Darren, if you will. And they answered him, We are the seed of Abraham, and we have been servants to no one at any time. How do you say you shall become free? And this verse always busts me up because they were under Roman rule. They had been under Greek rule just about 160 years before this, but they have been slaves to no one because they're still boasting in Abraham. They're boasting in Abraham like, because I have this blood in me or this family lineage, that that makes me special. And he answered, and Yeshua answers them in verse 34 and says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone doing sin is a servant of sin. So he's not coming to set them free from anything but their own sin. And the servant does not stay in a house forever, a son stays forever. If then the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Another verse every Christian knows. I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen of my father, and you do not, and you do what you have heard from your father. And then he tells them who their father is. And he's alluding to the same thing that he talked about in Mark 7, and he talks about over and over again. He says, in Mark 7, you have a fine way of holding to your traditions of man while violating the 
instructions, the law of God. And he's saying the same thing here. You're not listening to the Heavenly Father. You're listening to your Father. Stuff that's been passed down over and over and over again throughout the generations, forsaking the instructions. And, and we're in the same pattern right now. It's, it's amazing how much the Bible repeats itself over and over again. And in, Jer- in the book of Jeremiah, it says that in the end times, that men will come repenting to the Father, saying, Father, forgive us for the lies we've inherited from our fathers. And it's the same thing that we're seeing here. It's, it happens over and over and over again. The, the Bible is a pattern. Pro- prophecy is cyclical, and it continues to happen again and again on, on every level. So continuing in verse 39 of John 8, it says, They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Yeshua said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And so this is a direct reference to Genesis 26, where it says that Abraham walked perfectly in the instructions, the commands, the statutes, in the Torah of Yahweh. So he's saying, if you... If Abraham was your father, why aren't you doing what Abraham said? You guys claim to be descendants of Abraham. This is the thing that you're holding high and this, this prideful thing that you are doing. Well, then why aren't you doing his works? You're doing your lawless works of the Talmud, of the, of the oral tradition passed down by the Pharisees. You're not doing the heavenly works that Abraham followed directly. Yeah, and it's important to note that that verse in Genesis 28 says, Abraham walked upright in all my statutes, commands, and Torah. That was written about five to six hundred years before Mount Sinai. So anybody that tells you there's not little clues that they had this Torah before Moses came down with these tablets doesn't know what they're talking about because there's about seven or eight indicators in the book of Genesis that tells you the Torah was given before Mount Sinai. So continuing in verse 40, he says, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has spoken to you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the works of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of whoring. We have one father, Elohim. Yeshua said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me. For I came forth from Elohim and am here. For I have not come of myself, but he, but he sent me. Why do you not know what I say? Because you are unable to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Yeah, you know, that verse 41, when they say, uh, we were not born of whoring. Well, obviously there were rumors going around about this guy that, you know, 25 to 28 years ago or so that Mary was pregnant before she married Joseph. And so when you're trying to dig up dirt on somebody, they were probably talking about the fact that his mother was pregnant before she married his father. And it's ironic here, they're saying, you're the product of whoring, and he's the product of Mary and God, but we're children of God. God's our father. And it's kind of ironic that they're calling the son of God the product of whoring, but they're the sons of God, they're saying, or that God is their father. And then so in verse 44, when it says, you are of your father, the devil, uh, what, what, he's, what they're referring back to is this idea that we, we just touched on lightly in Genesis 3 and Bereshit 3. It says in, in verse 4, it says, and the serpent said to the woman, you shall certainly not die. For Elohim, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. So that, that was the promise of, of the, the serpent, is that they were going to determine what was right and wrong. That they, they wouldn't need God for that anymore, because they would be all-knowing, that they would know everything. And so this, this is where the, the Pharisees are at in, the, in their Talmud, in their oral tradition, is that they are starting to determine what is right and what is wrong. There's actually a part in the Talmud, in in the oral law that was passed down, that said we no longer abide by anything that we hear from the heavens, that we already know the truth, that we already have it all figured out, and we are going to follow our truth and not anything that we hear uh, from heaven. That's why Judaism is a horrible false religion. Yeah, I I look up a lot of sources and different things as we're putting this together, and I don't always agree with gotquestions.org, but it's a good place to start to find things about the Bible. And I love the way they answered that question. You know, man knew what was good. He was created in goodness and was surrounded by it in Genesis 1.31. He had been given everything God wanted him to have, including authority over all the rest of the creation. Adam had everything he needed to fulfill, for a fulfilling life. He did not need to know evil because when the only way for him to know was to experience it. It should have been enough that God had warned Adam against disobedience. God did not want Adam and Eve to know evil in the sense of participating in it. 
The sin of Adam and Eve was not attaining knowledge, but rejecting God's will in favor of their own. So we always read, Adam and Eve ate an apple. And why it's an apple, nobody knows, because nowhere in the Bible does it say it's an apple. But we were taught in Sunday school by these little pictures of Adam and Eve picking an apple off the tree with a snake wrapped around it. And we're always taught that they had the knowledge of good and evil. But we don't understand what the knowledge of something is. It's knowing the difference. It's doing. So what Adam and Eve actually got to do was put their will before God's. Because what did Satan say to them? He said, you will be as God, knowing good from evil. Well, how are you as God? You're determining what is good and evil. Only God can determine what is good and what is evil. So what is our biggest sin in life? Well, God might have said this, but I really feel this way about it, and I'm led to do this, and I want to do this. I am making myself God, knowing good from evil. Every time I decide that something in God's word doesn't apply to me, isn't important enough, or I know more than that, that was the great sin of man. Knowing good from evil was making yourself God or determining what's right and wrong in the place of God. You know, when we have no instruction, when we have no guidelines, when we have no plumb line to, to hold ourselves to, th there's, there's no way to determine. It's, it's lawlessness because we're all just coming up with our own ideas of what is good and what is evil. And, and it says in, in the book of Isaiah, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And is that not what we're doing in the church right now? When we're saying that something that was called perfect, when something that was called liberty, truth, holy set apart for thousands of years when we're saying it's no longer good isn't that exactly what isaiah prophesied about when he said we're going to be calling evil good and good evil we're calling something that was called good forever evil now we're saying that it's bondage we're saying that we should no longer hold ourselves under that it was called good forever that's exactly what, what isaiah is talking about and exactly what the pharisees were doing at this time by adding to the word of god and we're in the same scenario 2,000 years after his coming by removing everything from the Word of God. Yeah. What's interesting, too, is that Jesus called himself the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And with the cornerstone, everything has to line up with that cornerstone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that cornerstone... What's a cornerstone do? It holds everything up, like you said. So, so here's the difference. If Jesus came, or Yeshua, whatever you want to call it, if he came and said... Love God and love your neighbor, and that's all you have to do. And you ask 100 people how you love God, you will get 100 answers. If you ask 100 people how you love your neighbor, you will get 100 answers. And they will range from way over here to way over here. You will be as yourself. You will be like God, knowing good from evil for yourself, is basically what those 100 people would be doing. They would be taking this snippet of Scripture and making up a concept of what it means with no cornerstone, and it crumbles. We'll continue in, in John 8, verse 45, it says, And because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Who of you proves me wrong concerning sin? And if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? And he who is of God hears the words of God. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. The Yehudim, the Jews, answered and said to him, Do we not say well that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Yeshua answered, I do not have a demon, but I value my father, and you do not value me. And I do not seek my own esteem. There is one who is seeking and is judging. Truly I say to you, if anyone guards my word, he shall never see death at all. And the Yehudim said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets. And you say, if anyone guards my word, he shall never taste death at all. And so obviously what he's talking about here is the second death, in which is that being thrown into the lake of fire and ceasing to exist or being resurrected to everlasting life. And again, they are so far removed from their scripture and from the Torah and from the prophets that they're not even understanding what he's saying. They think that he's talking about living forever in the flesh, clearly not understanding the Everyone word of God, everything that he had just put before there. It kind of goes consistent with something he's going to say later in Matthew 10 and again in Luke 12. Uh, Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the being, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehenna. And then Luke, he says, But I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that are unable to do any more. But I shall show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after killing, possesses the authority to cast into Gehenna. Yea, I say, fear him. Now, we're always taught, like, I used to read this and think, Oh, the devil, fear the devil, because he could throw you in hell. The devil doesn't judge you to the lake of fire. Jesus is going to judge you to the lake of fire. Painfully, he's going to have to stand before you and say, No. And, you know, hell was used in many translations. I love the ISR because they use Gehenna. You have to be very careful when you see the word hell in your Bible to know what it is. Hell is not the lake of fire. Hell is not this place where you burn or, or where everything burns to chaff or the, the eternal fire. That is the grave. Hell is the grave. 
Gehenna is what he uses to talk about the lake of fire. We covered this a while ago. Um, it's when they did the English translation of our Bible, they translated Sheol, they translated uh, in Gehenna as hell, and it's given modern society this warped concept of what hell and what it is. Hell is just the grave. So when you say somebody go to hell, we're all going to hell. We're all going to die. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're going to the lake of fire. That just means we're all going to die and go to the grave. That's what, what hell is in the Bible. So Yeshua is specifically here talking about Gehenna or the lake of fire. And he basically what he's saying is, stand up for me in this body. Don't worry what they do to this body because I have the power. If you don't stand up for this body, that I'm going to have to put you in Gehenna. And Gehenna was actually a garbage heap that was outside of the town where that, that's why he used that phrase and that word because it was a reference to something that was actually happening where they would take all the garbage, uh, where it was just constantly burning and fire and fire and they were just burning up all the waste of the town uh, where there was rodents and animals and, and bones and weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where we get the illusion of all of that. He was using words, phrases, analogies that they could directly relate to, that they could directly understand and that's why we see that constantly over and over again, because he was referring to something that was actually taking place in their day. If, if you were of the goyim or of the nations, or in their eyes not a Jew, and you died, they wouldn't even bury you. They'd throw your body in Gehenna and burn it up. It was a place for, for people that weren't as good as them, in their opinion, where they killed dogs, you threw them in Gehenna, you threw garbage in Gehenna, you killed non-believers in Gehenna. So that's why he's using that as an analogy to this lake of fire. There was always something burning in Gehenna. The stench was foul. There were maggots and, and, and rodents and things everywhere, and that's what he's using as his reference. So continuing in John 8, uh, verse 53 says, Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Whom do you make yourself? Yeshua answered, If I esteem myself, my esteem is none at all. It is my Father who esteems me, of whom you say that is your Elohim, your God. And you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be like you, a liar. But I do know him, and I guard his word, his truth, his Torah. It says, Your father Abraham was glad that he should see my day, and he saw it and did rejoice. And the Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Yeshua said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Yeshua was hidden and went out of the set-apart place, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so there's so, so many beautiful parts in here, but the first one he says, uh, Your father Abraham was glad that he should see my day, and he saw it, and he did rejoice. And so we often think that, Anybody before the cross, well, you know, too bad for them. They were just, you know, it, it, born before then, and, you know, they had to follow all these rules, and they had different ways to get to heaven. But, you know, thankfully for all of us after the cross that, you know, we, we have that uh, gift of salvation because we can look back and, and know the Messiah. Well, that's clearly not true, and, and Jesus, Yeshua, is telling us this right here because the, the patriarch, uh, Abraham, Moses, Noah, they all knew of this plan of salvation. They all knew the truth of the Torah and this uh, idea and this hope that one day they would have this gift of salvation, that one day the Messiah would come. And that's why Revelation tells us that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth because this plan was always in effect. And so I, I went back to, to Genesis 3 just for a minute, and it says, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And this is uh, God talking to the serpent. And so this plan of salvation was here right at the very moment of the fall. Right at the very moment was the, the prophecy that the Messiah would come and that, that he would conquer all. That he would conquer the evil one that he would conquer the grave and then again in genesis 22 uh talking about abraham directly is when he goes to the sacrifice his son and he takes isaac up on the mountain and, and isaac's saying well, well abraham father where is this lamb where what is the sacrifice that we're going to use and he said son don't worry god will provide yahweh will provide the lamb and that's a prophetic picture that's a shadow picture that Yahweh is going to provide the Lamb of Salvation one day because they knew the feast days. They, they knew everything that was going to take place through this Torah and through the plan of salvation. Um, the other thing that's really interesting here is, and we kind of touched on this Friday night, the sacrifices and in, in the, the, the blood of bulls and goats and all that it tells us in the book of Hebrews was never meant for salvation. So we sit there and we look back at this in our 2016 Greek minds and we say, the only way to heaven is Jesus. You can't go to heaven any other way but Jesus. We all agree it's, it's only Jesus, that's it. Then how did all the people like, so then my next question, is Moses in heaven? Well, no, he didn't see Jesus. He was before the cross. Well, is David in heaven? No, he didn't see Jesus. He's Abraham, same difference. 
So they had to know Messiah to make it to heaven if the only way is Jesus. They did not get to heaven. Well, I shouldn't say get to heaven. They did not, they're, not going to re, they're not going to receive eternal life. How's that sound? Because of the blood of bulls and goats, they're going to receive eternal life and resurrection in Yeshua and Yeshua only, whether it was pre-cross or like us post-cross. They still had to follow Yeshua and believe in Yeshua. And all the things they did in the temple and all of that, the Bible clearly tells us was not for salvation. I threw this back in. I had this uh, at, at the beginning, and it says Yeshua goes up to Jerusalem for the festival of dedication. I had it in uh, the, the last time we met, uh, just talking about uh, that it's the day known as Hanukkah or the festival of lights. And that in John 10, 22, it says, now it was a feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. So everything that's happening in chapters 8 and 9 are the precursor, and then they're giving us, boom, 1022 tells us the time and the date. Well, if we're reading it section and section at a time, and, and due to our translators, they put headers everywhere in the paragraphs, we think that this is starting in a new topic, and now everything after 1022 is, is, the, is the Feast of Dedication. But if you're reading it all in context, as we're going to, you're going to see that he's saying everything up to this point was taking place during the Feast of Dedication. And the reason that this is important is because it's the Festival of Lights. It's, it's known, as, it's known uh, in the scripture as the Festival of Lights. And we're going to see a, a wonderful miracle that's about to take place that has to do with light and seeing light for the first time. And it's, again, just a, another thing that he is, is doing. Uh, it's not a Moedim, but it is a, a time that was celebrated, and it was a, a time where he's doing these miracles to point back to uh, the words of God. So in John 9, the beginning we see, it says, In passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his taught ones asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Yeshua answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of Elohim might, might be made manifest in him. It is necessary for me to work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one is able to work. So why is that? have been right before the sabbath mm -hmm. uh, so we see this day and night evening evening to evening sabbath is he, he's referring to that right here so he tells us he says while i am in the world i am the light of the world so uh, a verse we used last week he says having said this he spat on the ground made clay with the saliva and applied the clay to the eyes of the blind man and he said to him go wash in the pool of shiloh which means sent so he went and washed and came back seeing. So I, I've read this before over and over again, and I never realized that, you know, well, first of all, why is he doing all this? It, it seems kind of crazy that, that he's he spitting and see. making mud. You know, he's the Messiah. He is God. He could just, you know, touch him and, and heal him. But he's doing something for a reason and for a purpose. And I never was able to understand what it was until I started to understand Torah. And I started to understand the beginning of, of the book. And, and so... Uh, if the man didn't go wash, would he have been blind forever with the clay have just sat in his eyes? What, you know, he didn't just heal the guy. He put mud in his eyes and said, go wash. And it wasn't until he washed that he came back seeing. So we wanted to talk just about the pool of Shiloh real quick, uh, just to mention what it is and its, its reference in, in Scripture. Um, so it, it has to do, it, it's mentioned in uh, Isaiah 8 and Isaiah, I think, 22 are the two places that it's mentioned. But, but Shiloh is, is a word meaning scent or place of peace. Um, and it was the only source of fresh water inside of the, the ancient walled city of Jerusalem. So uh, the King Hezekiah, he, he built this, this tunnel that went through and it came from a pool outside of the city, tunneled through into the city, and it pulled up in, in this little walled entrance area where, where uh, they would have this fresh running water. So again, we see this illusion over and over again by our Messiah that he says, I am the living water, I am the flowing water. Those who come to me shall not be thirsty. Uh, those who drink of this uh, water will, will never thirst again. And we, we see this reference to this water and he being the flowing water over and over again. It was so important when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, they crushed it in. And when Nehemiah came back to rebuild the wall, one of the things he does is he rebuilds the pool of Shiloh in, in that area back uh, 70 years after they were captive in, in Babylon. Uh, so just throwing in a, just a little bit more history, it says uh, during the reign of Herod the Great, uh, improvements were, were made to this pool and enlarged, uh, and they said a uh, set of arches were built around the pool, and, and during this time that, that poor and sick people again would, would start to come to this pool uh, to bathe. 
This is also the pool that we talked about when we did the water libation ceremony of the great eighth day when, when the guy would go get the water, they would dip the water out of this pool, bring it over on the eighth day, and the people would be chanting, uh, Yahweh's my Yeshua, Yahweh's my Yeshua, and singing songs, and they would go pour it on the altar on the great eighth day, and then Yeshua stands up in the middle of the crowd and yells, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, I'm the living water. That's where that water came from, was the pool of Shiloh. So it had great significance to these people, because every year when they went through the feast, as we talked about earlier, on the great eighth day, there was this tremendous anticipation for this wild party when the priest would go dunk a picture in the pitcher of water in the pool of Shiloh and come and dump it on the altar, and everything would go wild as they were praising God for being their salvation. And again, just a couple months earlier, this guy stood up in the middle of the whole group and shouted, I'm the living water, that's me that he's dumping there. So this is kind of tying it all together, and that's why the pool of Shiloh is so important. So getting back to this the making of mud and, and why is it significant? Why did he have to make this mud and why did he do it in the way that he did? So continuing in our story, it says, uh, Therefore, the neighbors and those who saw him before that he was blind said, Is not this he who was sitting and begging? Others said, This is him. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am. So they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Yeshua made clay and applied it to my eyes and said, Go to the pool of Shiloh and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. And they brought him to the Pharisees. They brought the Pharisees to the one who was once blind. Now this part is key right here. When we get to verse 14, it says, Now it was a Sabbath when Yeshua made the clay and opened his eyes. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from Elohim, because he does not guard the Sabbath. Others said, How is a man who is a sinner able to do such miracles? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind one again, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And he said, He is a prophet. So again, if we stop here and we don't understand the context and we don't understand the Torah, it looks like, because of what the Pharisees are saying, and they're the Jewish leaders of the time, that it looks like he is breaking the Sabbath, or he is changing the Sabbath, or he is doing something to alter the Sabbath in some way. But again, that's why it's so important to understand our foundation, to understand our cornerstone, as, as John just said, what the Torah is, to understand the story fully. So finally, finishing the story, it says, However, the Yehudim, the Jews, did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight, till they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak concerning himself. And this is in verse uh, 22, it says, His parents said this because they were afraid of the Yehudim, for the Yehudim had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Messiah, he should be put out of the congregation. Because of this, his parents said, He is of age, go and ask him. So why the making of mud? Why the Sabbath? What is going on in this story that has to do with giving sight during the Festival of Lights and seeing light for the first time? This man who was born blind is now having the ability to see light for the very first time during this, this festival, during this time. And before we get into that, one other thing. If your adult son was blind from birth and received his sight, these people were so controlling, they were more afraid to brag about it or talk about it or, or anything that they were gonna get kicked out of the congregation that they just said, well, go ask him, we don't know anything about it. I mean, I, you'd think they'd be doing cartwheels that their son could now see and they're like, no, no, just, just go ask our son, it's his problem because he's the one who was healed and we don't know anything about it. That's how afraid and how controlling these, they, they thought they, that these Pharisees were at the time. So getting into the Talmud. So uh, the, the Talmud is, is the oral law and it was, the, the it, Depending on, on what sources you see, a lot of them say that the, most of the Talmud was, was codified as a written text around 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. Up to this point, so during the time of Yeshua, it was oral law that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation. So what we were just reading before when Yeshua said, you're believing your fathers and not the heavenly father, it was this oral law, this oral tradition that was passed down over and over and over again. So when they came out of Babylonian captivity, they knew that the reason that they went into slavery was because they had violated the instructions of God. And so what, what the, the Jewish leaders are at, at this time said, we're never going to disobey God again. We're never going to fall into that trap again. So we're going to start making fences around all these laws so that we make sure we never violate them. 
Well, that turned into making a law on top of a law on top of a law on top of a law just so they wouldn't violate the law. Where in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, it tells us do not add or take away from these instructions. So with you know, a couple hundred laws maybe, a couple hundred instructions that they might have had in, in the written text, they now had thousands upon thousands upon thousands. To now, today, the Talmud is books upon books upon books long about rules and instructions that you have to follow in order to keep this perfectly. So the Talmud, the oral tradition, actually had a law about making mud on the Sabbath. And making mud was considered work in any way, shape, or form. Even if it was not daily work, if you made mud, because they made mud for, for clay or for building or for any type of purpose, it was a violation of their oral law, of their oral tradition. Uh, and so they also, had, they also had a law against putting saliva on the eyes on the Sabbath. So whether it was a, a healing principle or, or some type of... There was a belief that they had at the time that the saliva of a holy man could heal you. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. So they were using it for medicinal purposes from a holy man for healing. And uh, again, walking more than a Sabbath day's journey. So we see him sitting there begging is what they were saying because he was blind. He was sitting next to this pool. He was begging. He did not move. He was blind. He couldn't see. And so he was sitting there begging. So what Yeshua did was he violates all three of these oral traditions, of these oral laws, of these man-made rules of the Pharisees, because he's saying, this is crazy. This is nonsense what you guys are teaching. I want you to get back to the instructions of the Father. So he makes mud. Boom, violation number one. He applies the, the spit mud to his eyes. Boom, violation number two. He's calling himself a holy man, and, he, and he's putting saliva on the eyes. And then he tells him, go up, walk all the way down to the pool, rinse yourself, and then come back. Well, that's farther than he had walked probably all of his life in a day. And so it was in longer than what they called a Sabbath day's journey. So he was violating law number three. Three strikes, you're out. These Pharisees are, are ticked. They cannot believe that he had just violated all three of these laws all at one time. And they are out for blood now. They want to get him because he is in direct violation of their man-made traditions of the traditions of their fathers but Yeshua is saying I want you back to the father I want you back to the eternal father the most high God his rules and his instructions I could care less about these man-made laws the things that you think are right the things that you think are good I want you to get back to the truth and get back to his laws and what he defines as righteousness see and until I read the Bible and really understood it that story made no sense like why did he have to make mud to heal this guy and why did he touch another guy's tongue and why did he tell somebody to bathe in a pool and why did he do all these things he was making a point to the audience he was spitting in the face so to speak of the religious leaders at that time showing them how stupid the fences they built around the word of God was and you know the, the scripture if you know the Torah it basically says do no regular work on the Sabbath well healing somebody's not regular work healing somebody's a miracle from God how much more can you glorify God than restoring a man's sight so he was basically for lack of a better term, spitting in their faces while they were all there by violating their laws out of love to keep his law and to heal this man. And so what's amazing to me is how everything starts to line up. He is not in violation of, of God's law. He is not changing Yahweh's instructions. He is not changing the instructions that have been given since the creation of the universe at the very beginning when he puts the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. And how much more beautiful that he goes up to their feast, to their dedication ceremony, that is called the Festival of Lights, and he gives sight to a blind man who had never been able to see before. The author of the world, the light of life, is giving light to the very first time during this festival, during this Feast of Lights. So and if he did violate the Sabbath, we got bigger problems than him spitting in a man's eyes. <laughs> so we got, we got three more slides here to finish up for tonight, so... Um, I'll, I'll be quick, but it and, and so it continues the story in verse 24. It says, So for the second time they called the man who was blind and said to him, Give esteem to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Then he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. I only know that I was blind, and now I see. And they asked him once more, And what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Why did you wish to hear it again? Do you wish to become his taught ones too? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> then, then they abused him and said, You are his taught ones, but we are taught ones of Moses. We know that Elohim has spoken to Moses, but this one we do not know where he is from. 
The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a wonder. You do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. So this man, who had not been able to see his whole life, not been able to read the Torah his whole life, is understanding, is seeing that he is the Messiah. He is getting sight for the first time. He has eyes to see, not just in a physical point, but in a spiritual aspect, he is able to realize who this man is. And because there was the, the prophecies of being able to heal uh, the blind. And it says, And we know that Elohim, that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone fears God and does his desire, he hears him. From of old it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this one were not from Elohim, he could not have done more at all. And they answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins. Are you teaching us? And they cast them out. So again, these religious leaders were holding themselves to such a high, holy standard that they were saying, you must have been born with sin if you were blind, so we don't even want to hear anything that you have to say. And it just shows how far off basis these people truly were. And so wrapping up this last slide, it says, Yeshua heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Elohim, the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Master, that I might believe in him? And Yeshua said to him, You have both seen him, and he who speaks with you is he. And he said, Master, I believe, and bowed down before him. And Yeshua said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those not seeing might see, and those seeing might become blind. And those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind too? And Yeshua said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. And this takes us back to weeks ago when we talked about the blasphemy of the Spirit and the, what the blasphemy of the set-apart Spirit is. And so he's saying, I am giving you sight to see, not just physically, but see the instructions, to see the light, to see the Torah, everything that we had just covered last week. That is his purpose. That is his mission, he says right here, that I am coming into this world to give sight, to give the Torah to those who could not once see. And now... I am showing you, I am showing you the light. I am showing you this truth. I am showing you the Torah. But he also says, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. So he's saying, if you don't know what's right and wrong, you can't be judged for it. But now he is showing them, he is uncovering it to them, he is revealing it to them, but they are so stuck in their ways that even though they know that it's false, they're going to continue on doing it. Well, that, by very definition, is blaspheming the Spirit because the Spirit is showing them what is truth. The Spirit is showing them what is, what is to be the absolute light. We'll wrap up there tonight, but um, um, Peg is going to has a song for us, so I'm, I'm thankful that she brought uh, her guitar and is going to sing. But I'm going to wrap up real quick in a word of prayer um, just so I can end, end the recording. Um, but, but basically, the, the whole gist of tonight's story was continuing from last week, continuing from last time, talking about the light and how the light is the Torah. And when Yeshua opens our eyes to what he did and how he walked, it is seeing that light, it is seeing that truth, and it is seeing that beauty for the very first time. 